My name is Lauren Artilles on behalf of Harvard Bookstore. I'm delighted to introduce this virtual event with Jennifer Nansibuga Mukumbi, presenting her latest book, A Girl is the Body of Water, in conversation with Leslie Neka Arena. I hope you're all well and safe. Thanks so much for joining us virtually this evening. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. We're hosting events every weeknight right here on Zoom. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com where you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Closed captioning will be available for tonight's event. Um, depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you might need to enable that yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase A Girl as a Body of Water on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year and a half, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Jennifer Nansibuga Mukumbi is a recipient of the Wyndham Campbell Prize and her first novel, Kintu, won the Kwani Manuscript Project Prize in 2013 and was long listed for the Atisalat Prize in 2014. Her story, Let's Tell This Story Properly, was the global winner of the 2014 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. And Jennifer lives in Manchester, UK with her husband and son. Joining her in conversation is acclaimed author Leslie Neka Arima. Her stories have been honored with the National Magazine Award, the Kane Prize, a Commonwealth Short Story Prize, and an O. Henry Award. Her debut collection, What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky, was selected for the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 and won the Kirkus Prize, the New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award, and was selected for the New York Times PBS Book Club, among other honors. Arima lives in the Midwest and is working on a novel about you. Tonight, they'll be celebrating the paperback release of Jennifer's novel, A Girl is a Body of Water, which has been named a best book of 2020 at Time, The Washington Post, and Oh, The Oprah Magazine. 13-year-old Carabo seeks information about her birth mother, who has not been present in her life, and learns from a local witch that the woman is alive, but not yet ready to meet her. This information propels her on a journey of understanding both her mother's absence and family's expectations, and the emerging independent streak within her that contains the essence of the first woman, a long lost state of being. Renesan Okoje says the novel is superb, an intoxicating tale that combines mythic and modern elements to make the headiest of feminist brews. And Namwali Serpel calls it a wonder, as clear, vivid, moving, powerful, and captivatingly unpredictable as water itself. I'm so excited to turn things over to our speakers. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Jennifer and Leslie. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that introduction. And I am excited to start this conversation with you, Jennifer. So um, one of the first things that uh, came to mind as I was reading um, not just this novel, but also your first novel, um, Kintu, uh, Kintu, is that you have a way of um, incorporating mythology into your work in a way that feels very folded in and natural. And, you know, this is, you know, you know of course, you know, a, a, a result of um, uh, uh, growing up in, uh, in a culture in which the, the mythology was, um, was similarly folded in, but I was curious about how you approach that from a craft perspective. Do you consciously, um, you know, structure the mythology that you would like to to um, touch on, and then build a story around it, or do you let things come in naturally? Do you invent, or do you stick to um, uh, sort of the real world mythology of, of um, this particular part of Uganda? 
Uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that wonderful question, Leslie. And thank you to everybody who has joined us this evening. Uh, a lot of thanks to um, Harvard Bookstore for hosting us. Now about um, the mythology and all African traditions, normally for me, um, the story is supreme. Okay, so I always plan and plot the story and this is the story of Chilabo and what is going to happen to her. Uh, then it's when I've got the story that I look for those uh, aspects of oral traditions, whether there'll be myth, whether there'll be short stuff, rather <laughs> folk tales right. uh, that are all even uh, sayings that I would fit into that story. So um, often I, I, so I had already told this much of the story, but then I realized that I could use this story here to enhance the rest of the story and, and, and then incorporate this other story to enhance the theme, you know? But because for me, um, oral traditions are an aspect of style, you know? They help me tell my story, but I'm not, my stories are not about the myth. They are not about the folk tales. They are about these characters and these aspects that are going on in my culture. Yeah. So always um, these stories come in to help me enhance those stories. But also sometimes they arrive and somehow they can, uh, they stand out, you know, and they ask for much more than, um, than I had prepared yeah. to do I mean, it I was thinking that because I, you know, there were um, uh, several instances where, you know, I, I would never have been able to guess what a chicken or egg, which came first, because it, it, it sort of perpetuated itself throughout. Um, yeah, absolutely. So often I'm not even prepared for that, you know, Leslie. Uh, you know, I take on a short, uh, a, a, an oral traditional story, and suddenly it's so, it demands for much more, much more space and much more attention. And often I, 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 I look at what it's going to do if I give it more, much attention. If it's enriching my story, by all means, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go for it. But if it's just taking over my story and taking it in a different direction, I'm like, thank you very much. <laughs> You are stepping out of here. Right. So if you look at those stories that I have there, I had quite a few that I wanted to tell, um, that I wanted uh, the reader to interpret and decode with me. But um, they started to, to do more than I wanted them to do. And they were taking my story in other places. So I started to edit them out. And in terms of, do I make them up or do, uh, do I get them wholesale from oral, uh, oral traditions? Most of the stories you have there came from oral traditions, but they don't always come homemade and fit into my story. Sometimes right. we arrive into the story and the story demands that I change aspects here and change aspects there. So for example, um, in my oral traditions and, and in the myth of originary uh, or origination, there's no Namazi character. Mm -hmm. uh, that one I created because yeah. I need yeah, it. Yeah, that was very necessary. <laughs> yeah. There was a gap, you know, because yeah. oral tradition didn't create that woman. So I had to create her, but luckily there was already a name in my culture, Namazi, which would suit her. So yeah. when it arrived, people in Uganda were like, huh, I didn't, I didn't know, know that. that. <laughs> <laughs> and now I don't know what to do. Yeah. Thankfully, I'm not on social media. <laughs> because they're like, how come we, because we, that is one myth that we studied in school. Yeah. And everybody's like, where, where was he? The name makes sense. Everything about her makes sense, but we don't remember her. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's the same, you know, what we do with history. 
yeah. you know <laughs> sometimes you bring history into your book and it must suit your story otherwise if it's taking your story over you're like no okay right. <laughs> which was um, something that you um, touched on with your first novel, where you sort of skipped several decades of colonization because it was just, yeah, this, this, yeah. Our, our story exists without this as well, or it, yeah. in the yeah. background. So, um, yeah, and so, you know, this sort of, uh, this element of, you know, this invention that you did with mythology actually dovetails nicely into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is that, you know, um, I've always been fascinated with mythology and how um, mythology, ex uh, you know, essentially um, is uh, a, 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 you know, a spark, sparse, but it's, it's somewhat of a blueprint for how sort of what the general cultural norms were um, when the when the, you know the stories were invented, and you know, and so you know, we, you know, we can you know, can study mythology. We can look back and sort of make all of these, um, you know, sort of. Uh, you know, make all of these assumptions about the way things were structured in the past. And I always thought that, you know, we need, like, we need to be writing mythologies now for the, um, you know, that that's, you know, ask the same questions and provide these answers sort of based on our own cultural understanding, based on our beliefs. And, um, and essentially, you know, like, I, you know, make ourselves part of history in that way. Is that something that you think about? I mean, you know, well, you, you invented, you know, um, um, this, this, this uh, character, so I'm curious. Okay. Um, um, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is, is myth, it, it, do we still reinvent myth? Do, do you think of, um, like, you know, sort of, just, I guess, you know, just sort of, you know, sort of throwing it out for conversation, this idea of um, inventing mythology that is speaking for us, you know, today, which you essentially did with that one where you, yeah. where you sort of built up on, on, you know, a past mythology with this sort of context that you needed for this modern story. Yeah, I, I totally um, think that we should actually be coming up with new myth and new mythologies. Because here's the thing, Leslie, wh whatever we do, whatever we think, life is about myth making. We do make myth of ourselves, you know, and we, we, whether it's the way we dress, whether it's the way we talk, it, the way we present ourselves to the world there's myth making there you know um th there's myth making at even tribal level think about it in africa yeah. you know all all those na first nations that existed before the countries we are myth making at big time yeah. you know and then these new nations that were created after colonization they are myth making but even at racial level, look at whiteness and all the myths that surround it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, if myth making is part of life, we are not going to get rid of it. But meanwhile, people are making myth about us. Think about all the myth about women. Right. <laughs> I mean, you don't even want to go there. It, it's 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 incredible. Now, all, all the myths about masculinities, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, and my 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 idea is that we first of all we need to debunk those myths that have misrepresented us. Mm -hmm. But then we need to create our own myth. Who are we? Yeah. What are we? Yeah. Where are we going? Where did we come from? What are we capable of? What have, you know, all of that. Because if we don't, somebody's going to do it for us. Yes. You know, and the nature of being oppressed is in such a way that you behave in a particular way and the oppressor creates myth out of, <laughs> of that, you know? So it's not just about, um, uh, acquiring um, uh, the acquisition of equality. Mm -hmm. 
We need to invent new stories about ourselves. And yes, myth making is critical, not just important, it is critical. So, um, you know, speaking of, um, you know, the oppressor, um, um, creating myths around um, the actions of the oppressed, something that you sort of touch on, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a theme for A Girl is a Body of Water, but you've also touched on it in some of your um, earlier work is, you know, this, this you know, the concept of um, uh, women being, providing, being the corrective for, uh, on other women, right? Like it's, you know, it's not just the sort of the patriarchy acting independently, which is not to say, you know, this is, which is not to let the patriarchy or, you know, men off the hook, like, you know, Squirm on that hook, please. But you know, uh, as part of you know uh, um, maintaining a system, you know, women now also take on the role of enforcers. You know, women become the enforcers of of sort of you know the the, the cult of womanhood and, and, and what it means. And you you know sort of deal with that so deftly in this novel. You know, we see you know something that I. Um, I really enjoyed were all of the different permutations of what a relationship between two women can look like. And the novel, um, um, you know, sort of you know, uh, 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 contextualizes a lot of that. And, but, you know, this, that, that corrective, that, you know, that's sort of the, 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 you know, the, 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 the female uh, corrective power, right? Which is only, almost only limited to other women. Right, yeah. is a part of, of sort of the conversation this your novel is having, and so you know I just sort of you know if you could uh, um, speak uh, you know, to that and how that was um, you know how that became a concept that you wanted to explore in um, in this book. Well, that whole idea came from uh, the the idea that I grew up with, with uh, people around me saying, oh, men can't stand, women can't stand women. Women are nasty to each other. Oh, worst enemies, da 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 da. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, if you want to see a woman's anger, put them with another woman. And uh, recently, I think what you hear now is women bosses hate women. You, you hear that even in the West, you know, that women bosses prefer to employ men. And I kept on wondering where is that coming from? Why would women hate women? But what the oppressor did not realize is that when somebody has been, someone's life has been made um, less worthy or worthless, okay? At one point they internalize that. Okay, and therefore it is easier to attack another worthless person than to, uh, it, it, this is common among all oppressed people. It's yeah. not just women. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's right. It's easier to punch to the side than punch up. So why not? Yeah. That, that is fantastic. That's a fantastic way because this person on the side is very close to exactly. you. I can, I can hit them, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, 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 absolutely. But um, the, and therefore, from that, someone picks up and make a myth out of it, not realizing that you're too far for them to punch back, you know. Right. But also, then we also take that in the myth and believe it. So this is why, for a long time, women would catch a woman cheating with her husband. And he's the woman who probably didn't even know he was married. But you can hit you can hit a man, but you can, you know. Yeah. And therefore, we then we started to say that woman is a, a husband stealer. She's the thief. But actually, we know very well that it's the man who uh, 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 you know approached her. But it's so we also aware that uh, you know he owes you, not her. Right. You know, right. We, we, we will get there. But um, in a way, we had all in, internalized our um, uh, our worthlessness, you know, and, and that's what I call Kweluma, that because you cannot bite anyone else, because there's you can't help it. If somebody is oppressing you 
and putting pressure on you and putting pain on you, you must release it. Yeah. Okay. And when you release it, it's people around you, you know, and, yeah. and, and always oppresses, even in, um, when you listen to um, some of the myths about black people mm -hmm. living among white people, yes. they would say, oh, they're savages. They are terrible to each other. They can't stand each other. They just didn't realize what was going on, you know? And it's important therefore for the oppressed to be aware yeah. that this, this is happening to us. And when it happens, sometimes we, we need a release and we just release on ourselves. And therefore we can hold it and say, hang on a minute, this is pent up emotion. This right. is pain that we are passing around or that we are passing on to our our, uh, our children. So one of the major examples that I use, especially when I'm talking to people in the US, is, is Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you just have to be uh, an outsider <laughs> to look at how Hillary was treated by women, even Democrats. <laughs> you know, you would hear someone say, he cheated on her and she stayed with him and not voting her. And then, uh, oh, seriously? Right. He, he cheated on her and you're punishing her? Right. Probably voted for Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, you know, somehow she became this um, punch by, by women. Uh, but uh, one of the things that really horrified me was when she was having this, um, 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 uh, oh, no, normally, the, 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 was it the debate between her and Trump, okay? And one time, Trump went and collected uh, yes, yes, the women, women yes. <laughs> that uh, whether Bill had cheated with or Bill had done stuff with, and these women happily came to intimidate a woman who did nothing to them, except that her husband did something to them. So why didn't you do that to Bill? Why, right. because, you know, so it, uh, because when you talk about the concept of the operas turning on each other, the West would think, oh, but how do we do that? But I'm telling you that was, eye opening and it, it just left me, you know, I, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, it's been really interesting. And I, you know, it's, uh, you know, the last couple of years um, in, the, in the States have really sort of like laid bare all of like the nation's like, collective wounds, whether it's racism, misogyny, et cetera, like everything has been, um, you know, has, has been exposed in a way that makes it um, uh, like, you know, like impossible to dismiss, to, dis to dismiss. I mean, it, you would have to be, you know, um, willfully blind or, you know, um, or, you know, like, or like, deliberately malicious to sort of say, you know, like racism doesn't, not, doesn't exist in this country. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and you know, I, thinking about you know how uh, oppressions work and sort of systems of power, right? And you know, as as sort of with you know, as, as sort of you said, right? You know, when um, when somebody who is oppressed needs to you know sort of you know, release this, you know, either goes you know to the side, right, um, and or internalize as, as self hate, right, uh, and rarely does it get directly aimed towards the power structure because just this is the understanding that that does not do it. It's, it's yelling into the void, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, and uh, the, your novel is one that is very aware of power and is very aware of even, you know, if you think of, you know, all of the, the different powers happening on, on, a, on a scale, right? You know, there's even the, the power between women, right? Um, um, you know, the power of beauty, right? Um, 
right? Or, um, and, you know, so I actually would really, I'd like to talk about that because beauty is something that, um, you know, there's a thread of, of, of this, sort of the consequences of being a beautiful woman, a beautiful girl. This is something that um, the, the novel sort of, you know, uh, touches on again and again. And, um, and so, you know, I, I'm curious about what your, you know, your thoughts on that and how you, um, uh, you know, how you, addressed it with the different various characters uh, in, in the novel. Okay, um, that, I, I, I did lose you at one point when, when, you, uh, uh, when you talked about the major aspect that you wanted me to talk about. Okay, um, was, uh, you know, this, um, um, uh, this concept of, of um, you know, uh, the pow women having power over each other, right? And, and yes, yes, yes. the ways that your novel um, interrogates that is with talking about beauty, yes. right? And talking about um, um, you know the way beauty can be you know both um, you know leverage and weight and burden, right? And so I'm, I'm you know, and how did you sort of go about um, you know um, using your characters to sort of talk about this issue because you know it's something that that you know, occurred again and again. Yes. Um... Again, that takes me back to my childhood. Uh, when I was a child, you, you tended to hear people say, oh, she's lucky, she's beautiful, her life is set out. Oh, well, she had better work hard in school because, you know, you know. And, and uh, I, as a child, I was quickly aware without looking in a mirror of who was beautiful and who was not. It, 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 it is incredible. And that did not happen with the boys. Right. It was always with the girls. And that beautiful girl then started to take center stage. Okay. And often she was light skinned, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and if you were dark, people tended to remind you, you need to work hard on Ambi. At that time, and the um, whitening yeah. queens were um, used in Africa. And so it, 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 we, we grew up knowing that the, the beautiful girls did not have to work very hard in school. But also it was in such a way that the beautiful girls, the gaze on them tended to be um, worshipping. It, it, it was, it was, you couldn't help it. You couldn't help seeing it. The beautiful girl in the class, the way the teacher talk, the teacher talks about her, the way the rest of the class re related to her. She was just beautiful. She didn't have to do anything else. She just had to be beautiful. And there was this sense that her life had been laid out because she was beautiful. Okay. And then of course there was, the girl who was not so clever. And the way they talk to you, the way they, rather not so beautiful, uh, but the way grown ups talk to you, including teachers, but also your friends, you, you are made aware quite quickly that you don't have it all, okay? And, and therefore, I thought that uh, under oppression, women had these tools or lacked these tools. So a woman that had beauty, those were tools, and those were tools to maneuver the oppression. That girl who wasn't beautiful, you had therefore to be better behaved, to be polite, to be, because sometimes they would say, oh, she's rude, and she's even not even beautiful. Like, as if, mm -hmm. you know, being rude is, you better be beautiful if you're going to be rude. But if you're ugly, you better be well behaved. So I, I grew up with this, with the sense that the ugly girl must work hard, you know. But also we had sayings that in, um, a mother that gives birth to an ugly girl works hard, you know. You start working hard when she's very young, you know, to do this, to do that, to do that otherwise she might fail to find marriage, but also life might not be kind to her. And when I went to high school, I went to one of the best schools in the country. 
And there was a saying in that school that only ugly girls make it in this school. And I, 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 it just didn't make, it, make sense to me. But it's until I went back in history and I found out that the ugly girls were told you need education. Right. So, it, so the, my grandfather, and my grandmother and my mother's generations, only the girls that needed education went ahead and joined that school. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the others would have a marriage proposal, which right. marries them and they carry it. So in a way, therefore beauty and looks either were a tool, but it was also a tool with which we were, the, the oppressor beat us or right. oppressed us with, you know? And I wanted us as women to start ha to have this conversation right. about the idea of beauty and beauty as a tool for the oppressor and for the oppressed or against the oppressor, against the oppressed rather, yeah. you know, but also to, to, to uh, luckily, I think we are starting to move away from beauty as something that is physical, okay? Into beauty as something that is achieved. This is news okay. to me. I didn't know that we were doing that. <laughs> is it my wishful thinking? <laughs> it might be. It just might be. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Um, like Chidabu's grandmother was so frightened of beauty mm -hmm. that even when she saw her granddaughter beautiful and she would say, she said, you know, you've become beautiful. You, you, you've turned into a beautiful girl. But then she would say, by the way, beauty is not physical. Right. <laughs> you know, because it, 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 it is that thing that, a, that the only thing that a woman could have and that she could use as a tool to maneuver, to manipulate, mm -hmm. to, you know, and if you don't have it, then you are all buggered. Right. Yeah, it's, um, uh, and so, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, by, without sort of giving things away for, um, um, for the audience who may not, have, may not have gotten this far um, um, in, in the novel, it's interesting sort of like the very, consequences that the different beautiful women have in their, um, um, in, uh, in the narrative. There are, you know, and there, there's another way that, you know, the women sort of are able to provide, you know, sort of leverage over each other. And you see this quite a bit, um, um, it, it, um, uh, in the earlier parts of the novel, even when Kirabo was a child, right? So yeah. class, Class is oh, yeah. class is one of those things that just complicates like questions of feminism, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, and I think about it sort of in the context of the United States, right? How in the you know the '60s and the '70s there was this you know um, women's power movement, and and a lot of women were sort of you know uh, fighting for the chance to go to work and work, and but what it, what it was it was actually a lot of Middle class and the wealthy white women who were fighting, right? Like you know, um, um, uh, everyone, everyone else, particularly uh, black women, had always worked, right? And so this is you know, so it's it's yeah, class complicates the question of of, of feminism and um, on what sort of that accomplishments, you know, this sort of you know, female accomplishment looks like, right? Um, and uh, uh, um, you know, something that the like, you know you touch on in this novel and. You have you you know you also you know did some of your previous previous works particularly with um, um, uh, Manchester Happened Book your short story collection where you uh, you know sort of have you have this I, I, the recurring character of sort of like the child of the house right the child mm -hmm. of the house who's sort of like you know a, a blood relation to whoever and then sort of various you know sort of like, you know more diluted blood relations who. who to rotate, you know, the poor relations is sort of like, you know, part of the yeah. ecosystem of the house and the power that comes with being the child of the house, right? Which is, you know, which is, and so, you know, we see this, you know, this sort of question of classism happen amongst children as well as in the adult world. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and and, and uh, Leslie, I was pretty aware of the uh, 
problem of class within feminism. It's one of the things that I put on the table and went around it over and over, looking for how to bridge class uh, and feminism. And I tell you, I failed and I thought, okay, I'm just going to put it there in the book and say, look, we have an issue here. We have a problem. And this is why, you know, Western feminism was not making any headways in Uganda because, you know, um, the middle class woman would say, okay, I've got my education, I've got my degree, I've got a job similar to a man. But when she left the house, the working class woman would clean it, yes. Yeah. And the, also the maternal space, looking after the children, bringing up yep. the children. Yep. But, but uh, 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 in her relationship, the mother, the working class woman and the, the, the middle class woman, the relationship was like man and woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are two women. So for them, the, the maids were like, what are you saying, feminism between me and you? You're a man. <laughs> I am the woman here, you know, and, and that makes it quite almost impossible to bridge. And this is why I say, let's go back to our traditional or indigenous feminisms. What were they saying? But also feminism that are articulated in our languages, because Western feminism came with English, therefore it comes with education, therefore mm -hmm. comes with privilege, you know, um, and it's very hard to articulate if you've not had any of that, you know, and 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 so um, you you see, Chilabo does not have the beauty, but my God, she has class. You know, and so yeah. Jiwa wields her beauty. Yeah. <laughs> she yeah. never pulls out her wealth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And these are little children, you know, they are 10, 11, 12, and yet they are instantly aware. Yeah. They understand. Yeah. You know, and, and 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 of course then it follows them, you know, up to uh, to the age where they can't pretend any longer, mm -hmm. you know, but they used to be closed. Yeah, there were issues, but they used to be closed. Yeah. But that's the nature of class and how we, we as women negotiate it. Uh, the, the important thing is to be aware. Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, because then somehow we might find a way to bridge that, Grand Canyon between the middle class and the haves and the have nots. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's interesting that you, you know, um, talk about, you know, have, you know, having these conversations in our own language. Um, and so, you know, I think about, um, you know, someone like my mother or my, or my grandmother who were not, you know, who would never have called themselves feminists, would never have used that sort of language to you know, talk about themselves. But, you know, per the definition, right, they were, they were, um, you, know, uh, you know, there were, um, even with sort of like, you know, the, the sort of class, the different class variations um, um, throughout the family, right, they were, you know, uh, like, so just sort of very briefly, so you know, my, my mother became a pastor of a church in Nigeria when the idea of a woman becoming a pastor was ludicrous. And it, you know, and so, you know, it's so like that, that, that it's, and that's a complicated feminism, right? Because this is a, it's like, you know, it's taking place within, within this Western Christian structure, right? <laughs> but it's also, right, it's so like, yeah, it is like, the, you know, yeah, there needs to be a way to sort of have all of these conversations simultaneously while also listening to each other simultaneously and just sort of hoping that everyone is comes to the table with good intent. Yes, and I think the problem with that is mainly how your grandmother passed on her feminist ideas yes. to your mother and how your mother passed on her feminist ideas to you. And I think this is where we've been failing. 
Yeah. And, I think, and, and this is what Insuta tries to do with Chirabo. Because Insuta didn't come up with those ideas, right. her, great, her grandmothers taught her about the ideas of what a woman is and how a woman came to be where she came to be. Now, Suta, after having an education and after having a life, she adds aspects to it and then passes it to, to Chirabo. But I, when I look back in my life, I'm aware that my grandmother, for all her conformity, had feminist elements, mm -hmm. you know? And, and back to my grandmother, you know, the, these are people who took you aside and whispered, Jennifer, you have nothing but education. Men, you can't trust them. Mm -hmm. you, but they're talking about your grandfather who you love. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but it's, it, it's, it's the way they've passed that on. So sometimes I, would, I heard my mom saying, oh, for me, I married a man. If he started misbehaving, I packed one dress. She, he did that, I packed my shoes. <laughs> the end of it, when it's too much, I just pick my bag and go. And I did not take children with me because I travel light. I that is my mother, you know. Um, but uh, in a way, we have not, and this is not just Africans, mm -hmm. it's the, in the West as well. We have not sat with our daughters, with our nieces, and said, okay, this is what I believed. This is why right. I did this, yeah? This, uh, sometimes you hear daughters being angry with their mother. You allow dad to treat you like that. Why did you do that? But um, because mom has not passed on her ideas, she has not explained why she did what she did, you know, to the daughters. But I, and I think it, that is one of the things that I would like us women to talk about because mm -hmm. men pass down their structures so efficiently. <laughs> it they do, yes. So effectively. And sometimes we help them. Right. You know, because I I could achieve so much and pass it on to a son before I pass it on to a daughter. You know, in the way we allocate resources as parents, yes. you know, yeah, we, we tend to give the son much more than we give to the daughter, even as and, the mother. Right. And, and require of the daughter to essentially like aid in the raising of the son. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so it, it's, it's, but also how do we bring up our sons? We, we yes. have so much time with our sons, but yet they turn into their dads, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? But this is, this is how we are handing down knowledge of feminism, okay? Mm -hmm. And of the, if, have you told your son how to treat women? Right, you know, exactly. You know, that, that may not help, but you, you know, rather than that daughters-in-law and mothers-in-law, how we hate each other. Again, right. this is about que the Queloma idea, the oppressed turning on each other. Mm -hmm. Why do, in, in, in our culture, we have a saying that to marry a man and meet my mother-in-law, I'd rather meet her grave. <laughs> Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yes, it, yes. It's <laughs> yeah. so incredible. So in a way, as women, we need to sit down and say, okay, how do we pass on our feminist ideas, both mm. to the daughters and to the sons? Yes, and then, you know, and all of this has to also sort of contend with the way that, um, um, you know, elders keep secrets from uh, like there's a secret keeping right and and I, yeah and I and yeah, I think that you know the sort of you know, the reasoning you know is, is you know sort of you know either you know rooted in some you know, they, they may not admit this right but it's rooted in some level of either like uh, 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 shame or the idea that oh if I tell this then it's like it, I'm perpetuating this but you know like you know I, I feel I feel very strongly that that, that you know 
there comes there needs to be an age where there's there are no secrets that there are no that there are no everyone should be everyone should know everything right mm -hmm. because, yeah because it's, it's part of that myth making right part of that myth making and part of the the story like the yeah the the, the you know even just you know, the you know the patriarchal structures, but also just like the, the family stories that you tell to, right? And you know, and what gets lost when you keep something back, and yeah, 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 absolutely. And and you know that that African cultures, when it comes to sharing information and knowledge with children, they they, they sometimes grown ups can say, "Get out!" Grown ups are going to talk, right? You know, uh, ch children do not partake of knowledge of, of of aspects that are going on in the family. It's always under the guise of protection. Right. But actually, sometimes it's not protecting the children. They are protecting themselves. themselves. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, again, um, it's an aspect that as women, because we spend more time with the children in, in, in that way, that we can therefore um, uh, fill in those gaps where there are silences between, between grown-ups and, 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 and children. And also, but also help to understand rather than, oh, the, this child is so talkative. Oh, this child is so inquisitive. Oh, what is wrong with you? You know, the way our mothers were, Perhaps mm -hmm. I've also been guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that you know part of it is you know um, that you know, they are trying to sort of spare us the consequences of of you know going against this like this the structure you know, the cultural structure right and, yeah. and you know and so you know it's like it's all well meaning but also destructive. Yeah. yeah. It, that is interesting because um, uh, before we had this discussion, I looked back in my life. So I, I had a grandmother who used to smoke and at, at around four o'clock, she would get have her shower, get dressed and go to the bar to drink. And then she would come back drunk, singing and dancing. We, we just loved her for that. Now she was a sister to my great grandmother, but she never married. And she used to say to me, oh, if I ever see a man crossing my threshold, because <laughs> she had her own house. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a child, she never explained why mm -hmm. she, she didn't have a husband, why she didn't want a man crossing her threshold, why she went out and drunk and why she was smoking and getting away with it i mean yeah. even i if i smoke in uganda it's frowned upon but yeah. my grandmother used to smoke yeah. and then i keep on looking through the generations uh, none of my aunties got married mm. you know and um and then uh, very few of my sisters have got married and then i look back and thought you know what while our parents talked about our mothers and our grandmothers and our great grandmothers talked about why they are not doing certain things, we were yeah. listening. Yeah. You know, but uh, you know, we just learned all of that by picking it up and saying, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. But we did not have a discussion. You know, the, this is why I decided I'm not going to have men in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, I built my house, I have my land and I produce my food. This is why um, I, I, I decided the men are like children. I'm not going to discuss things with them. If he says that, I just let him go with that. That's my grandmother. Right. Talking <laughs> about my grandmother. <laughs> you know, so, um, in a way, if only they had talked to me, mm -hmm. that with all those things they had been saying that I heard made me who I am. Yeah, yeah, and it's just yeah, it's and even yeah, having having their reasons articulated is like uh, that's a gift. That is a gift that you give the the the, the child that you're telling telling, and uh, and it just sort of allows for. Um, you know, a level of, of introspection that is that you know despite having arrived at the same place it's there's still 
something lost there, right? A conversation that should have happened. Yeah. Yeah. And and sometimes when we start talking about it, when the kids are like teenagers, they are already changing, you know, because there's a, there's a time when your child worships the ground you walk on. Mm -hmm. That's the time to tell them. <laughs> but then uh, they get to a certain age and they start to see weaknesses in your behavior and they get so angry with themselves to have, for having worshiped you. That's mm. not the time. <laughs> right. no, okay. They don't hear. They don't hear anything at that time. <laughs> yeah, but normally, uh, when a child hits 14, 15, 16, this is where they start to rebel because they are seeing you for the first time as a human being mm -hmm. who has weaknesses, but they are not yet ready to handle your weaknesses. Yeah. This is not the time to talk to them. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and often moms tend to talk to their daughters when they get married, when the daughter yeah, when gets they get older. Yeah, yeah. Or when they have a child and then they talk to you about having children. But that is late. I think children are quite receptive, even at 10, yeah. you know, 9, 11. You, you can digest it and give it to them in a, in a more uh, um, um, easier form to, yeah. uh, uh, to uh, absorb. But I think we should start talking. Yeah. OK, so um, we are about uh, at that time for questions. So um, our first uh, uh, question is from Tatrika Okafor, who asks, you talk about reinventing myths and inventing new stories. I find that really brilliant, especially um, it, it, as it creates scenarios with stories or in conversation with each other. My question is, isn't the existence of these problematic oppressor patriarchal myths an issue on its own? How do we silence those kinds of myths and make more equal feminist myths heard in a very loud and noisy world? Well, that's what I said when I said we need to break the myth that are misrepresenting us, that have been created around us. No one has a right to create myth around us. So we need to get rid of those. We need to debunk them and create our own myth. Because you see, the patriarchy created its own myth about mm -hmm. itself and then went ahead and created myths around us as well. That's a little bit greedy, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah you know, it feels like it's the idea that you, we want to tell as many stories as we can so that it complicates this like a, a singular myth, right? The idea that there's so many stories exist on that same level yeah. that yeah. it has taking power away from this being a singular narrative. Indeed, and, 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 and in a way, as black people, we've done that. Because mm -hmm. when you look back at the myth around blackness, mm -hmm. we're just, they're still there, we're still fighting, but my God, we are putting up a good fight as black right. people to end all the myth. And we have the tools, but we also have to create our own myth. Yes, um, I have another question. Um, for you know the, the the treatment on perceived beauty growing up, are you angry and do you see changes happening now? Yes, I am angry both for the girls that were portrayed as not beautiful and for the girls that were portrayed as beautiful. Uh, if you remember in 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 the novel, Nsuta warns Chilavo that beauty can get in your way because she herself was a very beautiful girl and she realized what people were saying to her as a child. You don't really need education. All you need is a, is a good marriage. Now, of course she was born in the 1920s, but again, it, uh, she was aware that as a beautiful girl, she did not have the chance to develop a character mm -hmm. because beauty was gonna do it all. She did not have a chance to see the other side of life. You know, it's until she lost her sight. And then she was, she suddenly saw herself as ugly and life, you know, changed. But also it's, it's the, 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 the girl who's cast as not as plain, 
-hmm. okay and therefore losing all that confidence to just be to, right. and also the the, um, the right to being rude as well <laughs> as you know, <laughs> you know, to, to just be yeah. equal yeah. to the beautiful girl and I, I um I am starting to see because uh, sometimes I hear people say, "Oh, how come people are not having ugly babies anymore?" But but I don't think children have changed. But we have, we are beginning to see that babyhood is beauty. It's yes. incredible beauty that mm -hmm. you can't say this baby is cute. This one is not. Right. you know but also we are starting to see that intelligence is beauty yeah. that um being entertaining is beauty being creative is beauty that beauty is not necessarily physical mm -hmm. that we are realizing that somebody can be beautiful and does something ugly and the beauty disappears it just psst, psst, goes I really want to talk about this tomorrow. We do have a hand, just um, a few more questions, and then um, we will wrap up the discussion. So, um, so an another attendee asks: Are there other authors working on similar projects of reclaiming and reimagining folklore through a feminist lens? Whose writing you are excited about? Um, I'm I'm reading a book from Peru. It's here, actually, I've been reading it today. It's called The Dust Never Settles by Karina Licorice Queen. I, I don't know whether it's come out yet. I mean, I'm just blown away. She's just incredible. She writes as if everybody is Latin American, you know? Uh, and therefore, the language just sings and dances, you yeah. know. I, you know, I love that, you yeah. know. And, uh, and, 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 and she talks to you as if you're a relative, mm -hmm. like you're having a conversation. So I would, I would recommend her. She, she, she's doing a fantastic job. I've just started it, but it, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, I haven't read any other books yet that are doing that or... I um they haven't come to the fore of my mind, mm -hmm. but um often when um myth uh, themes are similar, the the booksellers, especially on on um, Amazon, they tend to cluster together. So right. that will be uh, people will able to be able to identify them then. Yeah, like look, look for the recommended reads. Um, all right. So uh, last question, and this is from um, Tachiku again. Just curious, this question is for Leslie and Jennifer. How has the pandemic affected your writing? Huh. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, how has the pandemic? Um, I mean, you know, the pandemic on its own would not have affected my writing. Um, I work from home already. And so the, the sort of the uh, pandemic did not change my um, schedule or like the way that you know I, I interact with my, with my work, but there were other complications that um, that affected um, my um, you know sort of you know, um, the generation of work. But um, I also had what I think of as um, the epiphany that my novel has been waiting or has been sort of nibbling at for the last three years. And that happened because it was quiet. I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't doing anything. I was, you know, painting my walls and, and, and reupholstering my furniture. And something, and just like in that space, like this epiphany came to me and like solved the problem. And so, you know, it, regardless of everything that happens, that made my year worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, how was um, um, Unfortunately for me, I I got I was one of the very first people to get COVID. Don't ask me. No, how. I'm so sorry. So, so I got it around March, 
And uh, I, I, what it did with me was the fever. I got the fever and it would take me to that place where I am beginning to hallucinate. So suddenly my room had a lawn. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? But I was aware. It didn't take me over to forget that I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm hallucinating. So I would be like, oh God, I'm hallucinating. And then I would back, right. come back. And when I recovered, <laughs> for goodness sake, I could not read, I could not write. So I, I, I would just stare in space, you know. Oh, wow. I would pick up a book and read a sentence and forget what I had been reading. But also mm -hmm. it was such mental fatigue that I couldn't finish a page. Mm -hmm. uh, and for writing, I just, the idea of a laptop or a computer a screen just went away and I stared in space for a very long time. And what I did wrong was I kept on watching CNN and in listening to how many have died where and when and how. Mm. And I, it really was terrible. I think I started writing again six months later. Yeah. And even then I went to things that I had already written and started editing. But writing new material, I started uh, in February. But actually, when it comes to reading, this is the first book that I've picked up and read and enjoyed. And I cannot believe it. I keep on saying this book must be really, really good or my reading is coming back. So I'm, I'm quite excited that I'm reading again. Um, it hasn't been very kind to me. Uh -huh. I don't well, have I'm a novel. <laughs> I'm very happy that you're reading uh, the things that um, are, are sort of hopefully getting back to um, to normal. Um, all right, so the last our last question this evening um, is from Lisa Mate, and Lisa asks, she is curious about where you get your inspiration and what helps keeps the ideas sort of um, uh, flowing in terms when you are writing. You know what? That is a very difficult question for me. Where do I get my inspiration? For example, uh, I know all the books I'm going to write. C can you imagine? Mm -hmm. I I knew all the books that I was going, apart from the short stories, because the short stories came out of my experiences in Britain. But when I traveled from Africa to come and study writing, I knew the stories that I was going to write and I'm doing that. But where those stories came from, I have no idea. Mm. You know? all, all I can say is uh, I can't explain creativity and I can't explain imagination. The only thing I can explain is how to write and how I write. And But all I know is that my ideas come from what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've dreamt, what, um, my nightmares, right. um, what I've read, but also sometimes, especially in the shower or when I'm falling asleep, my mind works a little bit hard and faster. They, in, I don't know why that is. And I get those ideas and sometimes I incorporate them, but I, I would be lying to you if I told you that this is where I got the ideas or the inspirations. I, I think I take whatever it comes from. The creativity is how I put those ideas happening in my mind together to form a story. Sorry. No, that's, that's a perfect, perfect response. And thank you so much, Jennifer, for speaking to us about uh, A Girl as a Body of Water. And thank you so much for the audience for attending and for everyone who asked a uh, question. Um, there in the chat, uh, there are links to um, where you can um, purchase this um, fantastic book and you all have a good evening. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. That was fantastic. It was thank you. So everybody. nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leslie and Jennifer, for that beautiful conversation. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Yes, please do check out A Girl is a Body of Water and purchase it on harvard.com. And from everybody here at Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night. Keep reading and please be well. Thanks so much. Night.